I want to talk about Glad Tidings Tabernacle. This was our seminary. It was the School of Hard Knocks. We saw people speak against the pastor. We saw people looking around in the flesh who were bored with the congregation, and they were seeing greener grass on the other side of the fence, and they were itching in the flesh to leave. We saw these backsliders find each other and begin uh, plotting what they were going to do at the business meetings. We saw this man, Stanley Berg, who was somebody we always admired and looked up to, treated with very great disrespect. Like dirt. Like dirt, like he was some kind of criminal. Uh, actually, uh, at the business meetings, his wife would sit on the front row with her head down. And they were just talking about how he was boring, his sermons were no good, the congregation wasn't growing, this was wrong, that was wrong, they wanted to sell the air rights, they wanted to do this, they wanted to do that, they wanted to get a younger man in there, they wanted this, they wanted that. Well, they got what they wanted and they destroyed the congregation and it no longer exists. It's now a Mormon hotel. And we saw these backsliders find each other. They always find each other. That was something David Wilkerson told me once. They always find each other. And uh, if you read uh, if you read First Samuel, you'll see the horror of backsliding. Especially 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 13. I will judge this house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. You see, when you make yourself vile, and you speak harshly and without respect to the pastor, when you don't respect the pastor's wife, when you speak evil of dignitaries, when you rise up in anger and make yourself vile, you are setting yourself up for judgment. And God is not mocked. Whatsoever you sow, you will reap. And uh, you see, the thing is, he should have rebuked his sons. Go back and read that. First Samuel chapter 3. And uh, if you don't rebuke your sons, do you remember the man that was uh, lame? and uh, withered up, and uh, he was trying to jump in the pool. There were these five por por uh, porticos. A lot of people don't know what that word means. It just means a hall with a colonnade kind of hall. And uh, there was a pool there. And you can go there, and uh, it's been excavated in Jerusalem today. And uh, the idea was, if the angel stirs up the water, uh, you can uh, jump in, but you got to be the first one in. And if you don't, if somebody else gets in there before you, then uh, they're going to get the healing and you're not. And this guy was lame, so he couldn't jump in there fast enough. So when uh, Mushik Ben David was walking by, he said to the man, do you want to be healed? Because there was a writhing mass of sick people around this pool. And the guy explained his problem. But you know, when he did heal him, it was a Sabbath day. And instead of having wisdom and loyalty to uh, the, the man that did it, he went and ratted him out to the Pharisees who then persecuted him. We have found in the ministry that it doesn't matter how much you do for people, it's what you, what did you do for me lately? that matters, and even that doesn't matter. When Yeshua was in the congregation at Capernaum, he had some hard doctrine that, that he had to preach. And many people backslid. They were no longer going to walk with him. They, they said, uh, I'm out of here. And what was he really saying? He was saying, look, unless you eat, my flesh and drink my blood 
And they said, what? You're wanting us to eat your <laughs> You're wanting us to eat your flesh and, and, and drink your blood. What is this, a cannibal? <laughs> We're out of here. Of course, on the at the Last Supper, when Judas was doing his little backsliding thing that was going to cost him his soul. You know, backsliding is more serious than you think. You, you, you think it's just a little indulgence. Uh, oh, can't we all have a little vacation from the Lord? Come on. Uh, but you have to remember, he said, this is my body. I am the Exodus 12 lamb. And he takes the matzah and he says, eat this matzah. It is my body. Then he takes the cup and there's, a, there's wine in the cup. He says, drink this wine. It is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. He was, he was talking about this stuff way back in Capernaum. It wasn't an idea that he had that night. Because he was the lamb of redemption. The lamb that takes away the sin, that gets you out of bondage. And this lamb who was going to die was the Pesach lamb. And you know the story, you have to eat the lamb, you know, you have to eat the whole, you have to eat that lamb, and that blood is going to get you out. If the lamb is in your belly and the blood is on your door, you get out. If the lamb is not in your belly and the blood is not in your door, you don't get out. He was trying to explain that. And it didn't matter what he had done. He walked on water. He fed 5,000 people. It didn't matter. They said, we're out of here. People don't care. There were 500 people that walked out on uh, David Wilkerson. The great David Wilkerson. They just got up and walked out. Somebody whistled and they followed him right out, just like the, right. the Judas goat. There's always a Judas goat who speaks evil of the pastor. And then there's a, there's a few uh, dumb sheep that will follow that Judas goat to the slaughter. And uh, they always find each other. And I'm, I'm always a little bit concerned when somebody is disrespectful of the pastor because you don't talk to a pastor like uh, he's uh, dirt. dirt. We saw that at Glad Tidings and we saw what happened to the people. One by one, they were picked off in the, in the wilderness. God took them out, and I mean all the way out. I mean, all the way out. We we learned these things that down at Glad Tidings, you know, a lot of these Johnny Come Lately people, they don't know the story behind the empty pews, the people that rose up against us. Those people that rose up against us, they will never see the Yiddish New Testament. They will never know the joy of throwing those Yiddish New Testaments all over Burl Park. Why? Same reason Judas didn't see the resurrection. The backslider in heart is filled with his own ways. I would rather rebuke the vile and get them angry. John, uh, John Wesley said, make them angry first and then make them glad. They'll get angry, but then when they understand that you're telling them the truth and you're telling them because you love them, then they will think about it and they'll come to their senses and they'll say, you know, thank you. I, I needed to hear that. I, I, I needed that rebuke. And, you know, if you're in the hospital, you might say to me, Pastor, why didn't you rebuke me so I could be somewhere else? I'd rather be sipping Kool-Aid by the pool in the backyard than sitting here with a heart monitor on my arm. Why didn't you rebuke me? Well, friend, I, I will rebuke you if I have to. I'll rebuke myself. My preaching is basically you, you preach to the mirror, you rebuke yourself, and then people catch the spillover. But we're not talking about me now, friend. We're talking about God. Do you realize that God had taken about 1,500 years, actually uh, all eternity, to, to do what he was getting ready to do, to bring the lamb into Jerusalem and then raise that lamb on the third day. And when the lamb said in the, um, in the uh, shul at, at uh, Capernaum, uh, unless you 
eat my flesh and drink my blood. When he said that and they walked out, they were walking out on something that God had planned from the beginning of eternity. That lamb was, was slain before the foundation of the world. Yes. And God is planning things. You know how long God's been planning, distributing the Yiddish New Testament in uh, Borough Park? Oh, friend, it goes way back beyond 1970. I don't even know if you could put a date. It goes back so far, all the tears of Sister Plants, all the prayers. You know, some people, they don't care how much you, you wept or how much you prayed. They go right on and backslide. But here's the terrible thing about it, and I have to confess this. I think there was a period in my life as a minister, because I was called into the ministry in 1971. And that's a long time ago. That's over 50 years. But I would say that there was at least three years when I was backslidden. And, you know, I've had all these books I've written and all this stuff. But if you look at those three years, you will see I did nothing. God can't use a backslider. You will do nothing. You will sit spiritually speaking, in the hog pen, far from the Father's table. And you can go to a big church and raise your hands and dance around and uh, be real religious and all that. But if you know that you have missed God's will for your life and you are backslidden, well, the clock is ticking. I'd like to have those three years back. I don't know about you, but I don't like to waste time. And I ask God every day, forgive me for wasting those three years. Help me recover what the canker worm has taken. Because when you are backslidden, my friend, you are not a clean vessel fit for the master's use. You will not be used of God. Oh, yeah, you could be religious. I know a guy, he actually took a preacher's wife, stole his house and everything he had, and he didn't miss one service. He was in the congregation raising his hands and praising God with a big smile on his face every weekend. And he was just so happy. And today, this guy has a million dollars. But I wouldn't want to trade places with him. Because as I read my Bible, it's a wasted life. Now, I wasted three years, but I think this guy may have wasted 40 or 50 years. The backslider who knows better is wasting time time he can't get back listen you can make up just about anything in the world but you can't make up time and if you have self-will the backslider is uh in heart is filled with his own ways he will find another backslider and they will uh, counsel each other and justify their backsliding uh, selfishness thinking about yourself not thinking about the people you hurt uh, you know, when you backslide, there was a great evangelist. He backslid. Do you know how many people he hurt? All the people that their ministry was hurt, not just financially. All the people that were looking up to him. All the little sheep that were confused. Why is so-and-so gone? Why did they leave? What happened? I thought they loved God. I thought they were going to be here for us. I thought they loved us. Separation. Yes. Yeshua said, are you going to leave me too? Are you going to withdraw from me? 
Uh, we're not talking just about people that run off with the organist or sensuality or somebody comes out as a uh, perverted person and uh, uh, says it's okay, like one of my seminarian uh, professors uh, who became a great champion of the uh, alternate lifestyle of perverts. Uh, I I'm talking about people who cause trouble in the congregation and they cause trouble for themselves. And there will be chastisement. I feel chastised right now about the three years I wasted. Right now I feel chastised. Right now I feel guilty. And right now I feel bad. But you know what? Here's the, here's the uh, scary part. When I was backslidden, I didn't really know I was backslidden. You see, when you're driving a car, when you try to back up sometimes or parallel park, and you look at that side mirror, not just the rear view mirror, but the side mirror, there's a blind spot. And you can sideswipe a car, you can hit somebody. And I did not know I was backslidden, but I was backslidden. And it's only in hindsight that I could see that I was backslidden. There was a tremendous scarcity during that time. I couldn't get anything done for the Lord. And there was a certain desperation. The backslider in heart is filled with his own ways, but a good man will be satisfied from above. In other words, am I not enough for you? Kepa said, yes, you are. We're not going anywhere, Lord. You have the words of eternal life. Where else can we go? We're not going to leave you. So the 12 didn't leave him, but you know what? He said this. He said, one of you, one of you is going to betray me. One of you is a devil. Did I not choose 12? But I know your hearts, and I know that one of you is bad news. One of you is a Judas goat. And he's going to lead a little lamb out. And I don't know which lamb it's going to be. Uh, but uh, I want you to know here that uh, when you look at this scripture in John chapter 6, the last part of the verse, hallelujah. When you, I'm talking about the last part of the chapter, actually. John chapter 6. If you will go down here all the way to around verse 60 and start reading, uh, you will see that there were many of his disciples. And they said, your, your teaching is very severe. It's difficult. Who can, uh, who can listen to it? And uh, they didn't want to hear that kind of preaching. They didn't want to hear real preaching. They wanted some pablum. They didn't want preaching really too much at all. They wanted lots of music, lots of praise, lots of jumping around, lots of miracles, lots of falling on the floor. Lots of people saying, well, man, I'm a prophet. Oh, you are. Yes, you are. Do you call yourself a prophet? I am. I'm Prophet Jones. Uh, well, let me ask you, Prophet Jones, do you feel like uh, you're really uh, able to name it and claim it? Yes, I am. And I can correct you if you don't pray just exactly right. Uh, okay. All right. Well, I better pray the way uh, Prophet Jones tells me to pray. Listen, they didn't want to hear real preaching. They said it was severe and it was difficult. And they said, "Look, we're out of here. We don't want. We don't want to. We don't want to be around this. This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? Look at verse uh, sixty-one." But Yeshua, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see 
the bar Enosh ascending to where he was before. If this is if this if this is too difficult for you, what if you saw the ascension? What if you saw me going up on the mountain? Uh, you know, uh, you know where the Tabor. Uh, no, it's, the, the ascension happened from the mount from uh, Gethsemane from the from that uh, mountain that you go up when you go to Gethsemane. Uh, it was in the area of Jerusalem. He said, what if you saw the ascension? What if you saw me go back to heaven where I came from? Would that be a little bit too much for you? And you know, they could have seen that. They could have been one of the people that saw that. But they they uh, they were backslidden. They were uh, The backslider in heart is filled with his own ways. And so they sat down and they evaluated it. They said, I don't need a pastor. I can evaluate everything. And uh, I'm not going to listen to this. It's too severe. I want something else. Mm -hmm. So, uh, no, I'm not going to hang around. And it says, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you, there are some who do not believe. So you see, Yeshua saw that there was a problem, a fundamental problem with their walk as believers. Some people are cold. You cannot be in the ministry and be cold. You have to care about people. You have to love people. Ministers lose sleep at night. Concentrating on Praying for lost sheep. Is somebody snoring? It bothers. It it bo uh, it. Uh, somebody might be snoring. Uh, this message might be a little boring to them. But I want to tell you something. If you think preaching and being a minister is just you know taking some courses and getting an A and getting a, a reverend in front of your name and uh, getting to the to the building. And getting it. up and giving a little uh, a little homily, and then uh, patting yourself on the back that this was real preaching, and you don't really love the people, you don't care about their souls, and you don't really love them. You're cold. You're cold. You have a temper. You're you're a hothead, and you have a cold place in your heart, and you don't really care mm -hmm. about people. You should not be in the ministry because you will not make it. I know a guy, in fact, he was my age. He was a childhood friend. He's now a used car salesman, or at least he was. Maybe he's retired. He didn't have this, this thing. Paul talks about sleepless nights. Why was he losing sleep? Because he was praying for people. And at the end of his ministry, while Luke and him we're finishing writing the New Testament. Almost all these backsliders had almost all these backsliders had fallen away or backslidden. Demas, in love with this passing world, has deserted me. He says, "At my first trial, no man stood with me. All men have forsaken me." I know a friend out in California. He gets millions of people that comes to his website. He's got all my teaching on his website. And uh, he had a, about three or 400 people just walk out. They took their ties and they walked out. Why? Because there was a Judas goat in the congregation who spoke ill of the pastor and on Yelp said that the congregation was a cult and that the pastor was a cult leader. And so the little uh, 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 people, uh, they pricked up their ears and they said, really? And they said, oh, well, we're going to follow you. So they, they followed him right out the door, and they started another congregation. Wow. And, 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 friend, let me tell you something. This happens all the time. It's happened to ministers who are much more famous than I am. And it's happened to me two or three times. Uh, I wish you knew the story of every empty pew at Beth Shalom, starting from 1992. They would come in and they would sit there for a while and then they would get up and walk out. 
It didn't matter if a Bible was being printed or if people were uh, getting the word all over the world or if a Bible uh, gateway or Bible mm -hmm. hub or Bible or Bible this or Bible that or millions of downloads or whatever, whatever. It didn't matter. And we have found, we have found that when the backslider is uh, back, getting ready to backslide, it doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter how famous you are, how well known you are, how many tears you've cried for their souls, or what you've done for them, they will, they will walk right out. They do not care. Uh, ask David Wilkerson. Oh, I guess you can't ask him. He's in heaven, but he knows about it. And almost all great preachers that I know have had multitudes walk out on their preaching. So beware when all men speak well of you. Beware if uh, everybody comes to Yankee Stadium to hear you. Beware if everybody thinks that you're just the uh, hottest thing since uh, melting butter, uh, because it may not be. And look at this passage, my friend. We're talking about the Son of God here. The Son of God. And the people are walking out on him. And it looks like the 12 are even going to walk out on it. And thank God Peter spoke up because they were kind of listening to see how, you know, how Peter would uh, would feel this, this question. Because the question was, was, are you two going to leave me? Are you, is this, is this going to happen even with the, the, the ones that I've discipled? Are you going to walk out? Are you, are you going to backslide? And, and you know what? It's a dangerous thing to backslide. People talk about it as if it's just taking a little vacation. It's not a luxury. They 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 say, oh, backsliding. Yeah, everybody's done it. I did it. You really don't uh, think it's that important, do you? Um, some people don't even think it's in the Bible. And by the way, you don't think that it has anything to do with apostasy. Because if you're a real believer, there's no way you could ever apostatize. And we know that, don't we? Well, in Romans, Rob Shaul says, don't get proud against the Jews. Because if he cut them off, and if he cut Judas Iscariot off, he can surely cut you off. And then he says, Demas, in love with this passing world, has deserted me. So I don't know if Judas, uh, now you're going to get into, well, was he ever saved in the first place? Look, this is not your question to decide. It's not our will. What you have to do is you have to look in the mirror and preach to yourself like I'm preaching to myself tonight. And you have to say, Phil Goble, this is not about you anymore. This is, <laughs> excuse me. This is not about you. This is not about you at all. This is about what God wants done in Borough Park. And buddy boy, you better not backslide. You better make sure it happens. And during those three years when you were backslidden, you couldn't lift a finger. You couldn't put one Yiddish Bible in Borough Park because you were backslidden. And a clean vessel is not a backslider. A vessel fit for the master's use must be clean. And if you're not clean, if you're backslidden, you're useless to God. He cannot use you. And so, Phil Goble, we're preaching to you tonight. You better not backslide. And though none go with me, yet I will follow. It doesn't matter who leaves. You better keep your eyes on the prize. You see, Yeshua ben Dovid was making his plans to get to Jerusalem with or without the twelve. And he had set his face like a flint to go down there. And even in the Garden of Gethsemane, they flaked out on him. And as soon as he was arrested, they all took off. They ran, and that was it. 
If somebody had come up to him while he was in prison overnight that night and, and said, you know, we feel kind of bad for you, Yeshua. You've got this crown of thorns on your head. The soldiers have abused you. And uh, you're not going to get much sleep here. And then early in the morning, they're going to drag you to the Sanhedrin. And then the Sanhedrin are going to drag you to Pilate. And then Pilate's going to drag you to Herod. And then Herod's going to drag you back to Pilate. And the next thing you know, you're going to be whipped. And then the next thing you know, you're going to be hanged on the tree. Yeah. And here you are sitting in prison. And uh, it's fulfilling scripture. We know that. It talks about prison in uh, Isaiah 53. The word prison is there. So here you are sitting in prison. But you know what? We feel real bad about you, Pastor Yeshua, because you don't have any congregation. They've all flaked out. They've all run off. They all left. They all backslid. Yeah, they're backslidden. That's kind of bad. We feel bad for you. A pastor without a congregation. Everybody left. Poor Yeshua. Well, we're just going to pat you on the shoulder. And we're going to leave because we can only do a little prison visitation tonight. We just want to come in and see you. We feel bad about that little, those cuts on your forehead, the crown of thorns and all that. But nothing hurts as bad as losing your congregation, does it, Yeshua? Nothing hurts that bad. Well, let me tell you something. He was going to stand up alive on the third day. Judas was going to be hanged. And Peter was going to have to live down for the rest of his life, his little backslidden episode the with the rooster the crowing. And just like me, I'm living down for the rest of my life, the three years I was backslidden. I'm going to have to live it down for the rest of my life. You say, Phil, forgetting what lies behind, we press on. That's true. But I'm telling you, my friend, backsliding is dangerous. And if you don't believe me, go back and look at the end of John chapter 6, and see what it says here, because when the Yidden and Borough Park, when the Satmars pick this up and start reading it, they're going to see what he's talking about here. Now, I'm just going to read it. Yeshua, being aware that his disciples were complaining about his preaching, said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the bar in Osh ascending to where he was before? It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. When you're backslidden, you're useless. You're in the flesh. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you, there are some who do not believe. And there are people in the congregation who really have a problem with faith because they asked God for all these goodies and he didn't quite deliver. And they forgot that they made a big mess of their life for the first 40, 50, 60 years of their life. And they, they want to just snap their fingers and have God fix everything. And if he doesn't fix it, well, maybe they need to backslide. And uh, I know a young man, he would bless you with one uh, breath, but then he would curse you if uh, his prayer didn't get answered. And uh, some are like that. They're like little children in the marketplace. We played the fiddle and you wouldn't dance. And they expect God to uh, deliver just exactly what they want and when they want it. And if he doesn't, they're going to backslide or listen to somebody else. They don't want to listen to real preaching or a real preacher. They want to find a Judas goat and follow him out. But among you, there are those who do not believe. For Yeshua, hallelujah, knew from the first who were the ones who did not believe and who, were, who was the one who would betray him. He knew this from the first, from the moment he laid eyes on Judas Iscariot. 
But he said, for this reason, I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Yeshua asked the twelve, do you also wish to go away? And of course, they did run, didn't they? And when he was in the prison with the crown of thorns on his head, they were all gone. The congregation had been destroyed. You know, uh, there was a guy named Mark Gazowski who tried to destroy Beth Shalom. God put me in a trance. And uh, he was uh, driven away. And I know that God will do whatever it takes to save little Beth Shalom, even if all the backsliders leave and leave the congregation in the lurch. The congregation will not be destroyed like Glad Tidings Tabernacle. Actually, if there are bad people that want to destroy the pastor and the congregation, they are the ones who should be sifted and removed. And if I could think of about 15 people, if those 15 people had been removed, I think there would still be a Glad Tidings Tabernacle. But those 15 people did not get removed, so they brought in the Judas, the Judas goat, who was the, the uh, hireling who sold the building to the, to the Mormons. And right now we're dealing with Mormons. And God is going to help us. And he will come to our rescue. All men forsook me. Nevertheless, the Lord stood by at my side, and he gave me strength so that through me all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the, out of the roaring lion's mouth, and my God shall deliver me from every evil attack. To him be glory forever. And we thank you, Lord, that you have the words of eternal life. And we thank you for Psalm 119. And we thank you that uh, we have a call on our life. And we thank you, Lord, that you called us. And we ask you, Lord, to keep us from backsliding. And we ask you, Lord, to protect us from our own flesh. Don't let us backslide. And I pray, dear God, that in the mercy of the Lord, we will finish the race, keep the faith, and fight the good fight to the end. Though none go with me, yet I will follow. I'm thinking right now of a lady. Her name was Shepherd. Her father was. A shepherd. He was a, a a shepherd in New York. And this lady gave all she had to Jewish ministry. And her mother had left an apartment down in the village. And her brother was a phony with a cold heart who was supposedly in the ministry. And because he was married to another phony with a cold heart, these two said to Miss Shepherd, well, we don't want you living here anymore. So you can just go out into the street. So this woman was homeless. She came to Beth Shalom and I said, well, look, you could stay upstairs. No, she wouldn't do that. So she was staying in the emergency rooms of different hospitals. And that's where she would sleep at night. And she would sleep sitting up in a, in a waiting room chair. And nobody would throw her out because she didn't look like a homeless person, but she was homeless. And she was involved in Jewish ministry in New York for many decades. And she gave all of her money to many well-off Jewish ministers that I knew personally who shouldn't have taken the money. I wouldn't have taken it. And this woman 
finally died of a heart attack alone and forgotten in New York City. But I know that someday I will see her in heaven. And I know that she will have a great crown because nothing I've gone through is as bad as what she went through. And very often people in the congregations that you minister at are cold and they don't, they might weep. They might be able to, oh, they can turn on tears like a, it's a turning on a spigot, but they're cold. And uh, these people, they might do to you what was done to her. But, oh, Father, we thank you that our Messiah, even though he had lost his congregation and had, a, had only a crown of thorns and was reviled as the king of the Jews. King of the Jews, are you? Ha <laughs> ha. Here, put this. Put this royal robe on and let us bow down to you. And you're a prophet here. Let us smack you in the face. Now tell us, blindfolded, who hit you, prophet? Tell us, prophesy, ha ha. And then while he's hanging there, hey, if you are the savior, save us and yourself. Come down. Ha, ha. Are you thirsty? Would you like some vinegar? Ha ha ha. And he had no congregation. And everybody would have said that he was a, a failure. Yes, there were many lepers that were healed and blind people, and there was many, there was many crowds. People ate to be satisfied with uh, a little boy's sack lunch, even 5,000 people. He walked on water. He did all these things. But at the end, he was a failure. And maybe will be failures until the third day. On the third day, he will raise us up. Hosea chapter 6, verse 2. And if we endure to the end, and don't backslide, and don't end up backslidden, and don't apostatize, but endure to the end. Then he will not say to us, I never knew you. He will say, well done, good and faithful servant. And we will say, I don't know how faithful I was, Lord. I only did my duty. I'm an unworthy servant. But he will say to every shepherd girl, come to the banquet. His banner over you is love. Sit with your head on Abraham's bosom because God is going to reward you now because if you suffer with him, if you suffer with Moshiach ben Dovid, the abandoned pastor, then you will also reign with him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We give you all the glory and all the praise. And everybody said,